So uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the uh, Global Compact UN Leaders Summit 2020, where we're uniting business. This morning's session is with Farooq Khan, who is the CEO of the Pakistan Stock Exchange. Good morning, Farooq, and welcome. Uh, good morning, G. Thank you for having me here. Good. I'm joined by my co-host, uh, Director of the UN Global Compact Network Pakistan, Fasil Karim Siddiqui. I think he's just uh, having a little bit of technical issue. Uh, he'll be with us shortly. Um, so, Farooq, we're uh, here to discuss um, how we're all working together. Uh, obviously, we're in some unprecedented times. Um, COVID has put some unique pressures on both business, government, uh, and us as individual citizens as well. So this session really is a direct one-to-one. -one. We've got lots of people listening in from all over the world who are keen to hear um, some of the things that you've been doing to adjust to COVID, both in terms of being a business leader, uh, running the organization at the Stock Exchange, but also what the Stock Exchange has been doing to manage those issues as well. So um, as I said, uh, it's a light, casual conversation. It's not a typical interview. So feel free to respond uh, and share your thoughts and insights. Um, so first and foremost, um, I'd like to understand uh, a little bit about what you've been doing individually as the CEO of the Stock Exchange to adapt to the COVID-9 situation and then understand how you've then um, supported <clears throat> and represented uh, the huge organizations, the listed companies that, that you work with as well. So if you could just kind of give it a bit of a flavor around those two things. Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Zubair. Uh, as, you, as you mentioned, this has been a huge challenge for everyone all around the world. It's, it's unique uh, that whether you're an individual or a large business, it doesn't matter which part of the world you're in, you're faced with a similar challenge. Um, you know, I started at the PSX fairly recently, just in time for the crisis to hit. Um, and, um, you know, one of the, uh, as soon as I started sort of late Feb, the things that I focused on with my team were to just review our DR facilities, our BCP plans, as well as our remote working uh, protocols. And we were um, uh, in, in, a, in a way fortunate that, you know, we have some of the largest Chinese exchanges as our strategic partners. So we reached out to them as well to understand how they had coped with the with this uh, situation. Um, so you know when the lockdown. Um, you know that recognized the threat and the issue, and we were ready to to face it. So as soon as the lockdown happened, you know we move to working over 90% of the people from home and less than 10% right. coming into coming into the office. And, um, you know, thank God and, you know, with great support from the team, our board and the, and the regulator, you know, the market did not close down for even a minute. So our customers, I hope, didn't notice anything. It was chaotic in the background. Uh, I, I have to, admit. Sure. Uh, but, but everyone wow. pulled together and, and we continued, uh, you know, working as, as normal. And I think that that was really important um, for for not just investors, but also for the, as you mentioned, the companies that are listed on the exchange um, that, that, you know, despite the crisis and the challenges, we have to keep moving ahead while at the same time balancing the safety of our of our staff, of our stakeholders, of our of our customers. So it's not it's not an easy balance, but it's a balance yeah. that yeah. we have to you know, keep working and trying to achieve. So, so I'm, I'm keen to understand, you've mentioned that there was a lot of chaos going in the background and I'm sure it was, it was managed very well, you know, mashallah, you know, you, you, you run a, a very tight ship, but what about some of the pressures that, that you faced during that time? How did you feel uh, as someone, A, who's, who's new to the organization, but also having to deal with this, with this really unusual situation? I know you, you're very, calm and collected individual anyway um but how how did that stack up and how did you feel about those changes at the time you know did it come as a shock were you sort of prepared to some extent you know to be to be honest uh, that was a a uh, big sort of personal man management challenge that i faced uh, ideally when you go into a crisis um if you have to go into a crisis 
then you know if you are familiar with the team the team trust knows you trusts you you know the team yeah. you know who's what are the strengths and weaknesses of each individual in that team and and then you know you cover each other up um, but here uh, you know we were going into a situation and i'm sure it was equally challenging for for my team as it was for me because they didn't really know me you know how how i yeah. react under under pressure and under under such an unprecedented crisis um so so that that was a challenge um that, that to go into this and working with people and they working with me not really knowing knowing each other and ha- had not really worked with each other in the in the past but mm. hats off to the team we everyone pulled together and and um, as i said despite the chaos everyone stayed calm collected and supported each other to uh, you know to to come through uh, this this crisis which is not over uh, you know we yeah 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 absolutely june we will go back to um, uh, you know the separate teams that we formed in each department uh, but with the with the existing situation we've continued to really work mostly from home um so um, and, and you know the other challenge was that and that's one of the key lessons that is obvious but that that we learned uh, that you are really only as strong as the weakest link in your in your supply chain or in your services chain so so we had to work really hard with our customers our brokers because if the exchange works but they are not able to work then you know it defeats the whole purpose um, so really yeah. as well that they came forward worked really hard and and we worked with them to make sure that the brokers could also continue working which wasn't easy for them and and i guess that's that shown a strength of resilience in amongst your team and obviously how you're managing managing the ship um do you think that sense of resilience is echoed inherently in pakistan do you think across the nation um it's a nation of people that rally together in times of of difficulty and we work together and and I say that both in terms of your team but also in terms of the investors and the brokers and the people that you work with through the stock exchange I I th- I think I think certainly that 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 is correct and we've seen that both in our own uh, you know capital markets ecosystem where from mutual funds to brokers to the to the capital markets regulator everyone really pulled together and showed a lot of resilience you know some of the regional markets closed down we made that mistake back in 2008 and and thankfully and that was you know that was the real pressure um, there was a lot of pressure to be honest that let's close the market down for a little while and i think that would have been disastrous and in hindsight i think everyone is happy yeah. if we took the right decision but it 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 wasn't easy because unlike 2008 where it was a financial crisis you know here <clears throat> you potentially didn't know uh, that that you know were you really risking lives uh by by yeah. to operate or or not and you know in the end everyone got together and took a judgment call which you know thank god you know has worked out to be the right to be the right decision um but i think as a country you know pakistan as you know has gone through so many challenges over the decades and it's really the resilience of its people that has continued to pull us through and the strength in the civil society uh you know the large mm-hmm. um uh, you know the the large ngos that have contributed so much to to so many different uh, aspects of of life in pakistan and have supported the work uh, you know where the government perhaps has uh, you know fallen uh, you know for for the time um and yeah. you know that uh, you know when the sdgs were introduced pakistan was i think the first country to sign up on the agenda for sustainable development goals at the un back in 2015 so the commitment is there from the government the challenge is you know how do we all work together as civil society as business organizations as business leaders and the government to make sure that we are able to you know achieve these sdgs and i think post this covid uh, uh, situation um it's it's going to be it's going to be quite interesting and challenging because i i believe that investors are going to ask for more accountability and impact and sustainability in businesses and i think businesses are more going to be more focused in trying to deliver profitability um so you know how does that tension work out will yeah. be will be very important to follow uh, because i think it will be a shame that after having gone through this crisis if we go back to business as normal we would have lost a huge opportunity 
I think five years. So, if we cannot look back and and see how we all changed, what pivots did we take? What lessons did we learn from mm. this crisis? Then I, I think I think I think we would have really lost lost out. Yeah. So so that that leads me nicely to you. You covered how uh, businesses and investors are, 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 seem to be more impact focused, uh, and that's a great thing for the SDGs. Uh, and we've we've understood that there's inherent nature of a value system present in Pakistan, culturally, religiously, and in, in sort of in that context as well. Um, and as you look forward to the changes post COVID, you just highlighted. Do you think that this change and this period that we've gone through and this kind of focus towards impact, do you think that's going to drive the economy as a new impact-based direction? Do you think we're going to see uh, st being steered in a different direction? You know, as I said, I think businesses are, are going to, unfortunately, I, I think not just in Pakistan, globally, perhaps res resist that because they will be focused on repairing their balance sheets, repairing their cash positions, yeah. profitability, etc. But it is critical that that as investors, as regulators, as business leaders, we we continue to move towards uh, a more uh, to be able to account for our impact. And you know, one of the key things there is that financial accounts, financial reporting. It might sound boring, but it's critical that they also start reflecting impact. And as you may know, you know, Sir Ronnie Cohen and the G8 Task Force is already working on how financial accounts. Can can also uh, incorporate the cost of impact that businesses create because all of us have an impact, whether we recognize that yeah. or positive or negative, and it's no longer possible for businesses to create that negative impact and for governments, taxpayers, and civil society to bear that cost. It has to be accounted for. I think we will move in the next five years from a risk-return paradigm to investors looking at risk, return, and investment. And, and sorry, risk return and impact paradigm to to judge the performance of companies, and and you know we've seen that happen back in the 70s. You only looked at return. You know there was no concept of risk, mm -hmm. and we can see how it's developed. And in many ways, I feel risk is even more difficult to quantify than than impact. So I, I think financial accounts, you know, have to move towards this. I, I think you know that's a very pertinent point. I'm going to come to Fassi Sab in, a, in a, just a second. That that seems to be a, a, certainly a, a movement in a direction um, that seems to be more meaningful, but perhaps still a, a bit short from the impact focus. But it's a reflection, again, as you said, and a reinforcement of Pakistan's values and core practices. Um, and I'm seeing that it presents a smarter blueprint, if I can put it that way, for gaining a competitive. And comparative advantage over the long term. So that's that's an interesting point that you've raised. Um, we're almost out of time, but Fassi El Karim uh, is with us as well. Do you have any uh, thoughts, uh, Fassi Saab, uh, reflections on what the stock exchange can do for the SDGs and moving that forward? Uh, Zubair, thank you very much. First of all, I must thank uh, Faru for giving a very uh, uh, illustrative uh, background to the initiatives it took in very difficult times and uh, that was a very major contribution to business sustainability as well from the viewpoint of Pakistan's business. Uh, Pakistan Stock Exchange has been a very strong partner to the Global Compact initiatives for the last few years and uh, in fact we look forward that this partnership uh, needs to be further groomed up and further integrated into a synergy so that the business and stock exchange have to work hand in hand and together particularly when we are going to uh, enter into a scenario where business as unusual is going to be the new normal and i'm sure that uh, this partnership will continue to grow uh, we will continue to bring resilience in our business with uh, what we are doing uh, the initiatives you are taking, and that will be uh, that has been reflected in a, in, a, in, a, in an effective way in the stock exchange as well. But this needs to be further taken care of and further increased. Excellent, thank you, uh, Fasi Saab. So, 
Farooq Sab, what we're going to do is we're keen to have more of these in conversations and keep the conversations going post summit. So we'll be coming back to you and taking on some of the questions that we weren't able to take today from some of the uh, participants that are scrolling on the chat screen. Um, we've already got about seven or eight questions that unfortunately we're out of time of today. Um, it's been a pleasure having you. Um, really great insights that you've shared. Thank you for being so open and honest. And um, please do stay for the rest of the sessions. Um, we've got two more coming up. Um, one in just a few minutes, uh, followed by uh, another one at 12 o'clock. So we're back to back today in the Pakistan segment on the SDGs uh, in Pakistan. And um, please enjoy the rest of the uh, summits uh, with all the other sessions. And we could uh, be delightful to uh, hear your feedback on that. So once again, I'd like to thank uh, Farooq Khan, thank you so much. CEO of the Pakistan thank you so much and for your time. Forward. And we look forward to speaking to you soon. Thank you for having Thank you very much. And look forward to continuing Pleasure. to partner with, uh, with yourselves in UNDP. Thank you. Great. Fantastic. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, great. So uh, for those of you listening in uh, online, uh, that was Farooq Khan, the CEO of the Pakistan Stock Exchange. He had some insights to share uh, on what the stock exchange uh, has been doing, as well as the challenges that the... Uh, exchange has had to uh, pivot around uh, with the COVID-19 scenario and some great takeaways there as well. Um, certainly uh, echoing the resilience of the Pakistani uh, population, um, the opportunities that uh, a post-COVID uh, environment presents and also the uh, potential springboard for the SDGs as investors and brokers move towards um, meaningful business and impact focused um, uh, investments, I guess. Um, we'll be starting our next session just shortly. We have uh, Dr. Nassim Ghani, who is the uh, Secretary Minister in Sindh. Um, we are waiting for <coughs> two more speakers. Um, and as soon as they join, we'll commence. Um, so in the meantime, please feel free to share your thoughts on the chat screen on the right. Um, we will try and incorporate as many of those questions as we can. And um, don't, uh, don't move into the uh, private networking session just yet. We'd like you to, to continue staying here. So if you've got any questions, um, for the upcoming panelists, feel free to drop them in the chat box on the right. If you have any questions for myself or Fasil Karim Siddiqui, um, we're happy to answer those whilst we're still on and waiting for our next guest. So feel free to drop those in. Um, thank you, Yaya Janade, for your comments. Um, great session. Thank you very much. Uh, Nikuru Chimilu. Uh, apologies if we pronounced the names incorrectly. Um, you had some th questions for Farooq. Um, we'll make sure that those questions get to him and um, we'll see if we can do a follow-up session where we can ask that question. Um, Azaj Mohammed Susan, um, thank you again. Uh, comments are, thank you for the nice session here. Um, Dr. Julia Boget, B Boget, apologies if I'm mispronouncing names. Um, again, thank you for, uh, for all the love that everyone's showing. Um, it's great to be, to be on this platform and being able to bring people together. Um, so thank you very much for your comments. Um, just seeing a few more comments here. Fasi Saab, is there anything that um, we can share with the people that are listening in whilst we're just waiting for our, for our uh, guest about some of the work that the Pakistan office is doing on... Uh, actually, the, where uh, the, the SDG initiative is making a very uh, smooth inroad into the Pakistani business, we have, we have established an SDG champion club, uh, which comprises of about uh, 50 members, which, which have taken initiatives in uh, implementing and embracing SDGs in their core business and this is going to have a big impact hopefully in 
uh, the total overall picture of uh, uh, elevating poverty, uh, improving education, health, and various different fields. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, COVID has come at a time when it is giving entirely uh, unique lessons to business, lessons never known before, lessons never learned before, lessons never experienced before. And therefore, as things start emerging out of the uh, COVID-19 crisis, we are going to see an entirely new world of business operating in an environment which uh, uh, would be more uh, susceptible to human needs, which will be more uh, closer to relationship building. And uh, that is going to be a positive foundation of the new business values. So that Pakistan has not only shown resilience in this difficult time, uh, but also you said one thing very uh, interesting. Uh, our nation unites in emergency. And as we see, uh, the period beyond COVID-19 is going to be a period of emergency for the economic and social development of Pakistan. And this emergency demands that business unite together and work together to address the issues which the society faces in a way that we cannot, we do not only maintain our resilience, but also that we are going to reflect in terms of growth and in terms of progress. So I think uh, uh, the audience today, and I've been following up some of the events which are taking place for the last now quite few hours uh, in this uh, leadership virtual summit, uh, are indicative as to how vibrant, as to how provocative, as to how enthusiastic the world of business is uh, demonstrating in terms of its responsibility to respond to the new crisis and to relive and recover and readjust themselves with the new normal. So I think uh, these are some there are some great lessons for us to be learned in the process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what's been your takeaway for CISAP uh, over the past uh, 20, well, 18 hours, I think, since the summit started? What's been your key takeaway? What what one thing do you think is has come out for you in all the sessions that you've been attending? See, the world is more than ready to respond mm. to the post-COVID crisis. If I were to put the whole thing in one sentence, that's what I can get. The world yeah. is more responsive, more ready, ready than ever before to face this global challenge of living with COVID and coming out of it with more thinkers. That's what I possibly could gather out of a lot of things that are going on for the last 18 hours on the screen. Uh, and do you think um, one of the things that our, our previous speaker, Farooq Saab, mentioned that <clears throat> if we don't get it right this time, we've missed a great opportunity. Do you think, how true is that? Do you think if, if we don't do anything, <clears throat> now then we've really missed missed this great opportunity we've missed the boat as they would say in english there is no option of not doing anything there's just no option because we mm -hmm. have to we have to do we have to act we have to respond we have to show our commitment we have to carry on we have no option not to do something you know and 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 therefore uh, we need to uh, realize that both that that the boats are burnt, and uh, both have to move on and sail into the ocean with success and with uh, solidarity. Very great, great, thank you. I think we're still having some technical difficulties with our other speakers, but what I think we'll do, if it's okay with you and with you, Dr. Saab, um, if we start the session, um, yes, and we can at least take your thoughts and views and when the other speakers jump in we'll, we'll just uh, manage accordingly okay so um this next session then is um a a, a follow-on from the earlier session um the overall discussion here is um in conversation with thought leaders the sdgs in 2020 a reflection and reinforcement of pakistan's values we are now with um a uh, good friend, uh, Dr. Nassim Mulgani, who's the Secretary to Government of Sin, 
Um, he'll be sharing his thoughts along with a couple of other speakers. Um, our session here is fairly interesting. And um, we know that we live in a different world. So we have to look at things very differently. Um, Dr. Saab, firstly, thank you for joining us. Thank you for taking the time. I know there's a cabinet meeting happening, um, well, quite soon. Well, thank so you for having me. Thank you for having me. It, it's, it's a pleasure. Um, I'm just going to jump straight into it. So the, the world around us is very different. Five months on from, from the start of the year and COVID. Um, but the sentiment in tackling these issues and these challenges from food poverty to climate action is very much alive. I think never more stronger than now. And we've seen in our work at the uh, Global Compact um, that the growing number of campaigns from initiatives, protests, marches to fundraising events that people are hosting um, and the support of business uh, as well as government have been providing for their people in doing something to the best of their ability as best they can. And we're also hearing from our colleagues in other networks as well that there's a renewed vigor in doing good. Achakam, you know, this notion of we have to do something. Um, and that for us seems to be captured in this phrase of collective responsibility. And as I say, now, now more than ever before. And I think that's a great springboard for the SDG. What, what's your overall sort of opinion, of being in government, being a citizen, being a Pakistani, being someone who's traveled and lived internationally? What's your take on this whole pandemic and how we are resilient, how we come together, how we can unite with business? And do we have those inherent qualities that we talked about earlier with Farooq Khan um, about this will of doing good and being collectively responsible for what happens in society? What's no, your take on no, that? Thank you, Zabair. Uh, I would like to give you a brief background uh, of the pandemic situation in Pakistan, especially in Sin and Karachi. Uh, we started in panic. We locked down everything. The industry, the uh, the business, all the business were locked down. Then there was a uh, talk about that there was a demand that we should open up export-oriented industry and import-oriented industry. Was his bears witness that? Then we engaged into the discussion with the business community and with our chief executive to open up the export-oriented industry and import-oriented industry. And when then then I and Fazi Saab and other colleagues actually drafted SOPs, then we uh, got them approved from the government. And then we started with caution. Uh, export industry, uh, um, after getting their undertakings and after getting their SOPs uh, uh, implemented, that they will implement it. And then it was, first of all, objected by the owners that uh, uh, why the owner of the chief executive has to undertake for the implementation of the SOPs. So we, start, we started off uh, with caution to reopen the business and then now everything is almost open. And the result of that uh, opening up of the business and the industry is that, that we are again going for the second lockdown or select lockdown from today. And uh, some of the areas of Karachi, Lahore and other big cities are going to be sealed from today onwards. And I don't know for how long it's going to last. Uh, we are talking now of post COVID. I think it is, uh, to me, it's premature to talk about the post-COVID because okay. for the time being, we are having uh, projections which are really alarming and uh, dangerous that we are going to have uh, 80,000 people killed per day uh, in this COVID scenario. So when it's going to end, how, are, how many are the survivors? So first of all, we have to look into this government. It started with uh, panic. And then it was relaxed, and then was I eat uh, shopping and everything, and then and they were relaxed, and they are again reverting back to the panic. First, there was a defiance, and nobody was agreeing that there's a uh, pandemic like COVID, and now everybody is agreeing and criticizing the federal government, and the federal government is criticizing the provincial governments. So we are not even clear 
uh, about the about the uniform policy to address this issue. For the time being, uh, we are having shortage of uh, oxygen supplies. Uh, the uh, the prices of oxygen cylinder is soaring. You know, uh, they are profiteering up from 200 to 300 percent. And yesterday there was a concern that we are going to have shortage of oxygen cylinders even uh, to combat uh, with the COVID patients as a, as a first line of defense. Uh, the other things comes very late and you know, first is the solid oxygen of some oxygen supply. So we started with quarantines. Uh, we developed quarantine centers and we invested a lot of money in quarantine centers. And now we are going to develop the ICU centers. We are going to shift from the quarantine to the ICU centers. So definitely uh, uh, to develop ICU centers, we will, the government will be purchasing and the private sector will be purchasing the equipments which are required for the uh, required for this uh, um, ICU centers. So we are actually in the state of Dr. Flux. Saab, I, I just, yeah, let I just want to interject. Like, you, we are you, actually in the state of flux. Yeah. We are in the state of flux. Uh, uh, I could have a very good uh, wish list that I can share with you, but uh, I am facing reality. Mm -hmm. I am in part of the government. I am attending meetings, and uh, uh, it's really horrific. Yeah. I, I was just going to say, you raise an interesting point that you know you're working in a systematic approach, um, and I want to go back to my earlier point of you know how do we collectively combine? So we see that there's um, a collective responsibility that we all have to take. Um, what do you think the the public is doing to steer towards uh, working with government or supporting uh, each other in 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 trying to move forward from COVID? And I and I appreciate your point that we don't know what a post COVID situation looks like. We can only hope and pray. But what are we doing? What are you seeing sitting in government as how people, the general public, are are kind of uh, rallying together to to support and move forward. Uh, well, uh, kind of, uh, thank uh, you. Uh, examples? The, the public uh, is still defiant. And uh, okay. initially, there was a stigma attached with the COVID-19. So uh, whenever the government got the report that the, uh, someone is suffering from COVID in some neighborhood, the area was sealed and the patient was taken out of the uh, house and there was placed into the quarantine. So because of that background, the people are not even informing us, the government, that they are suffering from the COVID-19. And the another thing is burial of the dead. Because of the uh, people are, you know, sentimentally involved with the burial of the dead and they want to be part of uh, Janaza Namaz and you know that. So uh, initially it was denied to them. Initially, uh, the dead were buried uh, in different areas, in different graveyards. So people are, even today, in a defiant mode. They are not informing government properly. Uh, when they come to the hospital, then we come to know that they are suffering from COVID-19. And there is no random survey at federal level or at the branch level to see uh, whether they have been infected and they have recovered. I mean, uh, the, uh, the grocery stores and the milk shops were never closed. And the pharma, uh, uh, pharmacist was also never closed. We need to have a sort of a survey uh, of these people who are actually uh, doing business through, through, throughout the lockdown to see whether they have been infected and they are actually recovered. We need to go and do some antibiotic uh, antibodies test uh, so as to have some sort of a uh, idea that how, how many people have actually recovered without uh, being reported to the government. Okay, I think you, you raise a valid point. Thank you. Ah, we have, we have Nadeem Ahmed, the CEO of CERL Pakistan joining us. Thank you, Nadeem, for joining us. So we, we kicked off our conversation uh, about 15 minutes ago with uh, Dr. Nassim Mughani, uh, whom you know. Um, we're talking about um, the resilience of Pakistan <clears throat> in the light of the pandemic, how businesses are uniting together, and how the world around us is very different from what it was at the start of the year. And what are we doing to take, tackle these challenges, um, whether they be from food poverty to climate action, and the number of uh, initiatives and actions that we've seen from government, businesses, individuals, citizens of the country, 
in order to collectively work towards um, coming out of COVID in a positive way. Um, Dr. Sab, I want to come back to you in a few moments um, with a follow-up question. Uh, and just food for thought is, what do you think the people of Pakistan could do to help uh, departments and uh, government uh, to move forward with this pandemic, you know, short answer, and what could overseas Pakistanis do as well? Uh, Nadeem, I'm going to jump straight across to you and take your thoughts. So, like I said, we were talking about where we are right now. The yeah. um, world is very different. Um, I know you run a very large organization in Pakistan, um, and people can connect to you uh, and all of our speakers through their LinkedIn profiles directly. We've got lots of questions coming in on the right-hand side as well, but I want to jump in. Um, what have you been doing as a business leader uh, of one of Pakistan's largest organizations, I guess, to manage COVID uh, as a leader, first and foremost, you as the individual, you know, what are some of the things that you've had to deal with that might help other organizational CEOs uh, learn from or, or manage as they move forward? And do you believe that you need support from um, government organizations, uh, organizations like the UN, uh, support from general public? Is there anything that they could be doing differently or better so that we're all aligned, all aligned a little bit better to come out of COVID? So just take your thoughts on, on that. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Zubair, and the rest of the panel members. Uh, as you know that when we have heard about the situation in China, way back in November, December, from that time, the healthcare sector in Pakistan has already got alert because we were realizing this, that it will not remain within the China and it will definitely move on. And you can see that it move on to Europe and America and then the results are there. It was it started in Pakistan initially, it was very slow. During the first lockdown from uh, 21st March to 30th March, the casualties, the, the positive rate was very slow, but gradually it has grown very dangerously. And nowadays the situation in Pakistan is not, it's not that good, even it's quite serious. So being, being a pharmaceutical and healthcare individual, what we have done is the first thing that initially we tried to work out the safety uh, protocol for the healthcare sector working around. And the biggest challenge for Pakistan at that time during the March and April was the direct connection. And their protection was the extreme important because they are frontline fighters. If they don't have proper kits, if they do not have proper masks, if they do not have proper gloves, if they do not have the protective kits, how they can manage the patients. So as a cell, we took this responsibility and we ordered immediately about 50,000 protective kits and we distributed to the healthcare sector in Pakistan. And that was all free of cost for the country so they can immediately meet uh, the challenges that they are facing right away. That was the, the first initiative that we have taken as the COVID. And the second thing is the, the primary care because you see that COVID when it started and the doctors are sitting here, or maybe you can further discuss with the doctors also. I'm not a medical doctor, but the primary take care is very important. It's very important to provide the healthcare to Pakistani patients rather than they go to the hospital and they engage into a critical conditions. And most of the time that we can save the patient when they are into an initial stages by using certain immunity boosters, some primary NSAIDs, some primary antivirals, and some other medicine. So we have started working with the healthcare doctors in Pakistan to provide that facility to the patients so they do not go into a critical condition. Ultimately, now the situation is that we have more than 3,000 patients in a critical conditions across the country. And most of them are in a very serious condition. So what we can do is that to provide the first drug that has been approved by the US FDA, uh, it's not an approval, rather it is an emergency use authorization to Remdesivir. And uh, 
the problem is that remdesivir is still not available in pakistan because it is in the approval stages with the government of pakistan hopefully by next month we'll get the remdesivir in pakistan but luckily a neighbor country a brother country bangladesh they have already developed their generic version and they can do it bypass the patent right because they are following into a least developed country so the patent rights does not apply there so the moment we come to know that uh, Beximco has already developed the remdesivir as a generic version so we jump into bangladesh and we request it to their ceos and to the management that provide the medicine to pakistan immediately and nowadays that what we are doing is that we are providing that services to the pakistani patients and to the healthcare sector that we have already brought in remdesivir in pakistan and we are giving it to the different patients into a critical stage okay so definitely after doing all this together it's not maybe enough uh, to to fight with the covid covid is still is a big challenge in pakistan and luckily i am very grateful to the government of pakistan the drug regulatory the drug regulatory authority of the country the national disaster management cell ndma the authority they are supporting us they are working day and night they are also supporting across the pakistan the government of sindh is also working very hard to 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 meet this challenge but the greatest problem i think that we need to address and we have to bring into the knowledge of the general people which they are not following the sops i think today the great problem of pakistan is not the treatment it's not the healthcare it's not the front line fighter the greatest problem of pakistan right now is the understanding of the general public that they should follow the protocol safety protocol and the standard operating procedure that have been dictating to them from different types of media from social media from television from electronic media from press media that please avoid public places please always wear the mask please avoid going into the parties you know until unless the public will not start doing practicing this i don't think so that only medical healthcare or a pharmaceutical sector can help this challenge public should also come forward is a country with 220 million people it's not new zealand where you have 4.5 million people out of 17 1.7 million are kids and 1 million are old so it's easier to handle 4 million people they are living in just one corner in karachi so let's talk about pakistan so it's not only that healthcare sector can help alone until less public will not move forward so the public should move forward they should help us and they should try to understand that it's a serious problem of the global world and it's not easy the medicine is not the answer alone healthcare industry is not the answer alone until less public will not move forward so th- that raises both the point that uh, dr nasim was talking about earlier and, and what farooq had alluded to as well that we we have this notion of um working together in times of crisis but there clearly seems to be some gap at the moment as well and i i take your points on some of the steps that you guys are taking both as government and as private sector and also the steps that individuals need to take as well and clearly we we as individuals all need to step up our game as it were so that we're all better united um we've got some questions coming in and i'm just going to throw them so whoever wishes to answer so this is from um uh Farzan Hashim who's uh, who's the director of APAD a disaster resilience organization in Sri Lanka a good friend of ours what would be the strategy to keep the infectious curve flat uh without flattening the economic curve so Nadeem perhaps you're from a business perspective and uh, Dr Nasim yours from a government perspective um what can we do to keep keep well, this uh, curve flat with Well, yes. uh, well, to, to keep the uh, curve straight, uh, or to somehow to that straight level, we need to wear mask. A quality mask is required. Initially, there was uh, conflicting views about wearing of the mask. Everybody was saying that N95 is only for the for the medical professionals. I have a background of medical knowledge, so now everybody has to have um, a quality mask to wear. so as to avoid this lockdown so as to be in a condition of a lockdown to have a very good quality mask worn by everyone 
some of the people majority of the people are wearing uh, fabric masks prepared in their houses i don't know uh, what prevention is to be provided by that these sort of masks so we need to have a very good mask to start with and we should and make it easier accessible to government or to the people so as to uh, and affordable we should make it affordable and they are very expensive yesterday i was shown two masks and both of them were counterfeit and uh, they were fake of kn95 and uh, and they were prepared i'm sure one of our neighborhoods in karachi and they were they were labeled as kn95 and they are fake my fake masks and people are wearing them my some of my officers were wearing them so what we need is uh, the, at the un level we need to have a very good professional advice from you to what we require as a preventive medicine as a prevention of the disease even today uh, we are confused about wearing of mask and we say that kn95 is only reserved for the professionals yes it should be reserved for the professionals but it should also now be worn by the by the most of the uh, executives or whatever people who can afford them to wear they should be made available um three of our secretaries sitting secretaries in government of sin are infected this virus they have been using the surgical mask they were advised to wear surgical mask now they are infected with the with the with the covid 19 so the surgical mask is no solution the ordinary cotton uh, mask is no solution to the problem if you if you say that we are not going for the lockdown we need to uh, enforce upon the people to wear a good quality mask so that that can be a type of quarantine for the people Okay, Nadine, you, your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, I I think like uh, what Dr. Sharp is saying is is rightly so that uh, we need everything quality, that including even mask as well, and maybe I will just add the perspective of economics uh, into into that. But you see, now we have to realize one thing that world will not be the same world, the post COVID, and and the strategies of the all business houses. now should be a different strategies it will not be the same strategies where we have been working pre corona or pre corona the point is that the what we are observing that the industries like home hygiene personal hygiene healthcare safety will going to be increase in the years to come and people will be more conscious about their healthcare and about their life of course that is very critical and i am sure that government of pakistan will also despite wasn't very uh, exceptional number they have kept for health sector but i think there should be a more investment are required to meet the health challenges in pakistan so what i believe that saying this that it will not affect the economics i think it will be wrong it will definitely affect the economics because i have been running a group which has a different kind of businesses healthcare is only the one part of the business i will different businesses like retail businesses we have habit we have dunkin donuts we have other like fertilizer business agriculture business and i can see the definite decline in the other businesses but i can see at the same time the increase and in growth in healthcare sector so that reflects that after corona whenever it's going to be over maybe in august or december or next year or maybe after vaccination but the world will not be the same world and and then the country of pakistan will not be the same so definitely we have to strategize the priority of the business that what kind of businesses will take more growth in the years to come compared to that what businesses will not take growth anymore definitely the effect on the minds of having like hundreds of thousand casualties across the world now people are little bit uh, scared and they they believe that traveling is dangerous tourism is dangerous now going to another country is is not easy now and it will not be that easier also either in the in the future so i think that uh, this is the time that the global leadership should sit together and work out that what kind of it and it's a total business discussion i am talking to you that it should be depending upon the business leaders of the global that how they are thinking to move forward
that should be more practical and acceptable to the general public, consumers, customers, and the entrepreneur. But it is definitely going to be a different world. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that both of you, um, and that was going to sort of lead into one of my points, and I think you've answered it already, is that do you believe there needs to be, uh, there needs, there is a need for new strategies uh, to meet the complexities and challenges of COVID-19, and clearly that seems to be uh, a, a, an affirmative big yes. Um, but what do you think needs to happen so that we leave no one behind? So the leave no one behind is a phrase, it's, it's a momentum, it's a movement, an initiative that the UN is fully endorsing and supporting, that we're all inclusive, that absolutely no one anywhere is left behind as a result of how we move forward as society. And, and that links into, I'd like to take your thoughts, both of you, on how can we advance goal eight, which is decent work and economic growth, given we're in a COVID situation at the moment. And then goal 10, which is reduced inequality. So we're obviously talking specifically about the SDGs, but what can we do to ensure that as we move through this journey of COVID and this pandemic, and we're all trying to adjust and adapt and pivot our businesses, our environments, whether that be working from home, not working at all, closing businesses, reopening businesses, the stagnation of how that's happening, and then also the uh, pressures on CEOs and, and people in government, uh, people like yourself, and dealing with how to manage that, not knowing what the end of the road looks like. Um, what are your thoughts for advancing uh, decent work and economic growth and reducing inequalities? So, um, Dr. Nassim, if you'd like to share your thoughts and then we'll move across to Nadine. Well, uh, we have to learn uh, to live with the COVID-19 uh, for at least one year more um, because the projections are that vaccine is not coming uh, uh, in a, in a year's time. So, if that vaccine uh, is successfully uh, uh, prepared, that a vaccine will be available mostly to the America, to the to the other developing country, developed countries, and it will not be available even uh, after two to three months of its invention in Pakistan. So we have to learn how to live with the COVID-19, and to live with the COVID-19, we need to have protective measures like, uh, as I already mentioned, a good quality mask and good sanitization. Uh, you cannot uh, be, uh, teach people every time to do this, do that, and don't go to the public places, don't go to the industry. We have tried that and we have failed. Initially, we uh, in the first phase of lockdown, we have tried that. We have failed. It is not sustainable. So we have to open up. We had opened up. And because of this opening up without any SOPs and caution, the, the infection is spreading like anything. So we have to, again, uh, Reaffirm the, uh, reaffirm the fact that you can wear a good quality mask, have a good hygiene and work normally. Live normally as you used to live with some sort of a chain that you are wearing a mask and, and you, are, uh, you have to go to industry, you have to do the productions. Maybe the uh, production for the health and pharmaceutical companies and the, uh, the, uh, the companies um, we have got well-known companies like Gulam and Alkaram. And Gulam, to my knowledge, is preparing masks. And I have asked for the one of the packages to, at least uh, I should have uh, understanding that what type of mask they are preparing. If their mask is capable of uh, protecting the COVID-19 uh, to, to some extent, more than 60% or 65%, I'm not talking about 95 or 85, that will help us to restore to the normal life and to resume the normal life. Okay. Without this, um, in Pakistan, uh, I think it, just, it will not be sustainable to lock down indefinitely. So you, you think it's, it's a mix of uh, facilities, services, accessibility, yeah. uh, using common sense as well, you know, using your own judgment and, and working out where you should and where you shouldn't be going. Ha a change in behavior, definitely, but also a change in attitude. And one more point I uh, would like to uh, yep. add, Zubair, yep. that now we are, we are not going to uh, focus about the quarantining the people. That phase is yep. over. 
we should now go for the uh, additional ICUs are uh, established in our hospitals. We have to reshift the wards from the, we have got the medical wards in every tertiary unit. We have to reshift the medical wards because nowadays uh, the medical wards are lessly attended. So they should be shifted in ICUs. We can do it at Karachi, we can do it at Namshoro, Hyderabad, mm -hmm. Larkana, Nawabsha, everywhere in Sindh and also at Lahore, Islamabad. We have got teaching hospital tertiary units. Now we need to shift from this quarantine psychology towards the development of ICUs because things have happened. We need to have yeah. additional medical cover provided to the COVID-19 patients. Okay, and I think that then will, you know, from the, the vision that you're seeing in the journey, that will help reduce some of the uh, issues around inequalities and also sort of bring more people together. Nadeem Sab, just what's your take on that? You know, how can we reduce inequalities? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree with Mr. Ghani, like the life cannot be stopped and then you have to move forward. One has to be always optimistic that and in Pakistani, you know, the resilience and, you know, we always, always come up, you know, from the bad times and, and whatever times. So inshallah that I'm very hopeful that this is going to be over. Our economy will be back and we will definitely continue to work. And even at this point of time, like all the industries are there, they're still working. Now, the point is that how we can make a workplace safe place. So we have adopted certain strategies also for that. We have some kind of a mix of strategies. It's not that everybody need to come to the office now. What we have learned also from out of COVID, which is you may call it a blessings in disguise, that now we have learned that people can also work from home. So there are certain departments completely working from home. And then there's no, nothing is happening to the productivity and the outcome of the results of the organization. So that's a great learning. The second learning that we, we also got is that the way we are talking to you now, that online communication globally, like for every contract, for every meeting, we used to travel. Like every month I've been traveling uh, to Europe, America, Paris, and other countries, which for the last couple of months, I'm sitting at home and I'm conducting almost uh, different kind of meetings, sitting in my own office. So I think that maybe continue in future also that you can save your time, you can save your energy and the money too. At the same time, we can also reduce the workplaces also. And the third thing one, that is also one, one critical like is the personal, M M M yeah, yeah, please. Personal, protection. personal protection is also very important that we have provided to the workers. Like for example, in factories where you cannot stop people coming coming to work because the, in factories you cannot work sitting at home. You have to be there to pack the units and to run the machine. So in that case where this is compulsory to come to the office or a factory, so there should be a proper cleaning environment, proper validation environment where one can work safely. Still there are chances of COVID, but yes, we can still provide a lot of protection to our workers and in a safety environment, you can get the output. So let's see that how long we have to continue with this COVID. But we have to remain firm that one day the bright future will come back and a country like Pakistan will race again. Because uh, probably there's an advantage also when you are not so much developed. So you do, you do not lose too much also. So that also like if you, if you compare European countries or with America, probably we did not lose that that much as they have lost. So maybe it is easier for us to cope up the economy, uh, the size that we have and the work we have. So, and, and, and the greatest part of the Pakistan economy is that like 50% people are young here. So the energy is there. So I'm very optimistic about the energy that we have in the country and it will fight back inshallah. And you will see that after one year in 2021, Things will be quickly fixed very fast. Well, I would like to add on. Dr. Sab, you wanted to yes, comment? Yes, of course. Well, Nadeem uh, later on mentioned that point that I was actually uh, need to talk about. Uh, to work from home is only uh, possible for the desk workers. 
and uh, it is not possible yes. for the labourers, possible for the agricultural labour or agricultural workers. There we have to, and how much population we are talking about that who can work from the house, I mean, from the home, from their homes. Um, that's not much of the population we are talking about. And most of the population, they work in the fields, they work in the industry, the, their laborer have to physically work over there. They cannot, the job management, the clerical staff can work from the homes. And that is not, we are not talking about much of the population in that, you know, uh, in that uh, bracket. So we have to have uh, protective measures to work in the uh, work when, when they are going in, in, the, in the crowds, they should be wearing masks, they should be with the COVID-19. Without that, there is no uh, survival. Uh, we cannot survive. We are a poor country and we will collapse. Our economy has uh, already uh, have been shattered to some extent. We have to recover from that phase and we have to live normal with the COVID-19. And uh, luckily we have got agriculture. Uh, we have got the food security as we are, we, are, we are surplus wheat producers. We are surplus rice producers and we are also surplus sugar producers. So one of the basic things that you are required in the country we have, so we have got environmental uh, security, sustainability, one of these uh, SDG goals, we have got environmental security in Pakistan. But um, other securities uh, we have to struggle, uh, economic and social. But environmental security, yes, we have. So I, I want to come over to Fasil uh, Karim Siddiqui in just a moment. Um, how is how do you both think? And just a short answer that we're talk, what we're talking about when we when we refer to people working from home or using you know, online meetings like we're doing here now as well is digital transformation. Um, but is there is there not a concern? And I think Dr. Sab, you kind of have alluded to this that digital transformation or working from home remotely or vir from virtual environments is not accessible for everyone because there are people working in agriculture in the field but we do have access to smartphones to some extent in Pakistan what what's your takeaway in terms of how do we ensure that we leave no one behind so what what smart things can we do as a country as a collective as a nation as governments as business to ensure that obviously from one perspective Nadine Saab you can make the work environment much more conducive to being able to work from home and obviously government can support that as well but what about those people that don't have access to laptops or technology um, or even the basic smartphones as well what do you think we can do to ensure that we keep them included and we don't leave anyone behind quick takeaway uh, dr sab and then nadine well uh, i said that we are talking about small segment uh, that can uh, use the uh, use of the smartphones and technology uh, Mm -hmm. uh, farmer has to work in the farm. Farmer has to uh, do the plowing in the tractor and other activities in the field. And uh, the industrial labor has to work in the factories. They have to do production physically. So what mm -hmm. is uh, any use of smartphones or any laptops? We can have discussion, we can have chat jobs, we can have desk work on these things. But wherever is the physical uh, work is required, I mean, if you are going for your haircut, you have to go to the saloon. He, he will not do it uh, by a smart means or through smartphones. You have to have to, uh, physical contact with each other. That's why they have been, you know, banished in Pakistan. They are not being. So we, we have to look at we when we talk about uh, the opportunities of working remotely or virtually or or digital transformation. I think we have to look at the, in the local context as well. So not we every are, country. We are, uh, so where we are talking about a small population that that they, they can work on the yeah. who, whosoever the desk worker can work from the uh, from their homes and do the desk work, but whosoever is not desk worker, they have to work physically to earn their livelihood. The laborers, the the farmers, mm. the different people who are working in in, in the, the fisheries, the other block, they have to work to uh, earn their livelihood. Uh, what you're talking about is use of this technology is we are talking about a small population. Yeah. Yeah. Nadine, uh, your thoughts? Yes, okay. Yes, yes. Yeah, um, I, I agree what Janice is saying, like uh, it's limited that you stop that you can ask them to work from home. But what I'm saying is that that's another learning. That's a learning curve. Like 
for the first time we realize that work from home is getting recognized in pakistan it wasn't even recognized before like if somebody will say uh, pre corona that i have been working from home might be you may not agree with that if you are really working but today if somebody would say that i am working from home so it it is being considered that yes yes it, it is it may be possible that you've been working from home i think that will last long and i think for female workers it would be very nice that if they would start working from home maybe we can we can have more women working uh, by that way of doing work as far as concern to agriculture farmers labors i do have, you cannot continue working from home because physical presence is important there the only thing is that that you have to provide conducive and healthy environment where the worker can come into the field whether it's an agriculture field or the plant where they are work, coming and working so i think that is the responsibilities of the senior management of the organizations to provide them an environment so they can work protectively there that is our responsibility one thing i would like to add further that i think mr zubair pakistan is the country where this cellular phone probably use rate is among the highest uh, in the top 10 or top five countries more than 120 million numbers are already subscribed you know so even the villages in pakistan even you go to the small town in pakistan the wifi connectivity is very very economical and cheap in this country and now people are not like way back 10 years or 20 years they are more aware if you go to even a small village they you talk to the village they have good knowledge so it is you cannot compare them like 20 or 30 years back when they don't even know what is happening in the urban areas now exactly they know what is covid they exactly know what is happening that's another that's another story that sometime they do not respect the disease very seriously but they understand it very well and the message can be come across whether it's a is a small village or a big city that is easier now to communicate now television is in almost every home they they hold the television the cable system is there people are watching 100 channels even in a small town so you have lot of mediums are available from where you can use and educate your public i, th- I think general public you, you've and hit masses. nail on the head there that um first of all i'm i'm glad that you raise the issue of gender parity and gender uh equity that we 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 forget sometimes to talk about um including women in this whole digital transformation era because many of the the types of work that are done in indigenous pakistan um perhaps where women are not fully included in that so thank you for raising that point and that's a discussion that we will have in due course as well um but i'm also gl- glad that you raised this topic that we we have to look at context that we make a lot of perception errors um about countries like pakistan that we um don't have an understanding of how to use smartphones and as you said the the smartphone penetration in pakistan is huge um and the majority of people again an assumption do understand how to use mobile phones and technology uh fasil uh, i want to come to you and i know you've got some broader context on this as well what can governments and companies uh where do you see some of the the alignment and the uniting of these their organizations come to help address things like uh leaving no one behind uh decent economic work and growth um and obviously reducing inequalities what do you think in this pandemic they could both be doing uh from a un perspective to help address those issues and given that we're in this difficult time where there are pressures both on government and pressures both on business are some of those asks actually very easy so over to you yeah uh, well i think uh, much has come out of uh, what dr sab and nadeem said i think there is a need for what i can say uh, a sort of uh, 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 a campaign to educate our mindset of our people 
in responding to the new to, to the challenges of the pandemic we need a pandemic uh, mindset to be developed and for that there is a very unique opportunity of business government and civil society uh, coming on one page and starting a, a national campaign of educating people right from the growers and the, and the farmers in the village to the uh, urban population in the city and to the street walkers and the shopkeepers and the uh, you know so we need a, a building up of a mindset which is responsive to the needs of pandemic that is number one uh, it's not difficult uh, as i said this is a nation which responds in uh, crisis but they need a proper guidance they need a proper uh, road map to go for and that is the challenge that we are facing at this moment and dr receives have very rightly said that uh, if we do not respond now and we do not train and educate our people to to live with this situation and observe what are the most essential prerequisites for living in this scenario we will not survive and there's no reason why business government and the civil society not develop a common page in developing the sort we have a media we have uh, uh, educational institutions where everything is going through digital uh, uh, digital access and we need to use them for uh, training our people in observance of uh, sops in observance of physical distancing in in the impact of what may happen if it is not done because we also sometimes uh, survive in fear and fright and as a matter of fact as the lockdown was softened and uh, dr sir very rightly said everything came out and all the precautions were kept on the side uh, thinking that things are, are are over and nothing is needed and possibly start the life again into the old normal but i think we need to uh, develop the insight into our people to live with a new normal and that new normal can be the slogan of uh, either it is digital transformation or whatever the next important thing that i think i would like to touch is working from home yes it is for the first time that in 70 years history of pakistan that the working for whom uh, from whom is being uh, accepted as the new norm uh, although it is not yet being used very uh, generously but i can say that in the urban areas in particular at least uh, 10 to 15 percent of the people are working working from home and they have proved that it can be more efficient it can be more responsive and more uh, uh, result oriented than uh, what it was being thought for before. So uh, this needs to be further uh, increased. The, the, the number of frequency of people using uh, digital uh, access to perform their work needs to be increased. The corporate sector has to encourage the use of working from home as the new norm. And I think uh, we will take some time but in this time, we will learn to live with these norms. Yeah, Dr. Saab, please come uh, Well, uh, yes, uh, uh, Mr. Saab has uh, very properly narrated and briefed the whole proceedings of the meeting. Actually, this uh, era that we are talking about, people used to call it even before this COVID-19 as post-industrial era and an era of information, information technology. That COVID-19 has actually fostered the speed that speeded up the use of information and we, there was a talk of virtual education there was a talk of virtual businesses and now we are we are seeing it happen uh, at a at a greater speed because of this covid 19 that that has come as a reality before that there was a concept that we are going to have this the industrial era is over that actually industry area lost it for two to three centuries but now that is over now we are living in an information technology era 
and because of this COVID-19, that has speeded up. Nadeem, do you have any sort of comments on what Fasi has said or what Dr. Nassim has said? I think I think it's already it's already summarized what we have been discussing since last mm. 30 40 minutes and uh, I think the way forward is to accept the the covid and we have yeah. to plan accordingly and we should not be we should not be scared of it rather we should be planned that how we can fight with it and we have to live with it and I think that uh, we have the potential and we have this energy uh, that we can fight against that covid and we can come back Pakistan I am always optimistic that Pakistanis are very talented, competent, and they can they can achieve anything. Great. I think you have in, captured uh, both of you uh, the sentiments of a nation, um, the sentiments of your respective organisations, and have given us some valuable insight as to what the next few months look like in terms of the journey we all take, but also what we what we need to do collectively to ensure that we can come out of this positively. Um, and some of the things that we perhaps need to uh, review uh, and, and look at in terms of how we do things differently, because clearly this, this is not business as usual. Um, thank you both very much for your time. Um, we will carry on these conversations. They are very important. And as Fassi said, we have to continue in working together and aligning together and, and being more synergized in our approach. We may not always agree on what that looks like, but we should work together towards the, the uh, destination um, and we need to be smart in that approach as well. So once again, I'd like to thank you both for your time, for your insights. It was a pleasure having you. Um, we'll continue the conversations and um, we're just waiting for our next lot of speakers to come in. You're welcome to stay uh, and listen in on the conversations. Um, you're welcome also to go and jump in on some of the other sessions, uh, networking over the course of the next, I think we have another eight hours uh, left of the Leader Summit. Um, and uh, for everyone that's listening in online and sharing comments uh, and questions, um, if you have any questions for either Nadim or Dr. Nassim, feel free to drop them in the chat box and then we will make sure that they get to them. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for seeing Thank you very much for having us. Pleasure. Bye-bye. Pleasure. Thank you. Great. Okay, so for everyone else that's uh, listening in online, um, we are waiting for our next speakers. We have Jahan Ara from the Nest IO. Welcome, Jahan. Hi. Sir. We're waiting for... Good to have you looking bright and chirpy. It's what, uh, midday now in Pakistan. So uh, it's excellent. Um, yeah, we're just waiting is. for Fahad yeah. and Wakar um, to join us. Um, but we'll do, some, we'll do some conversation anyway. We'll do some gup shop. Um, yeah. I, I, have my yes. I have my coffee. I'm sure you have a desi chai. Um, so, no, I'm a coffee drinker. So. Oh, you are? Great. Fantastic. Good, 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 good. Yeah. And um, yeah, what's, yeah. what's your favorite style of coffee? How do you, how do you take your coffee? This is going to... So I have, my coffee, I have my coffee machine outside wow. and I use fresh roasted beans to make oh my, my gosh, coffee. you just made my day. <laughs> Quite a coffee snob, if you will. Okay. But, but you know, uh, it's, it's interesting um, that a person's... Um, background of where they've lived uh, throughout their life is is somewhat given away by the, the way they drink their coffee. So clearly you've been influenced from your time perhaps in Hong Kong or, or elsewhere. Um, Actually surprisingly uh, I started drinking coffee when I lived in the UAE for about five wow, years. Okay. And the reason for that was that I had to decide I was never a tea drinker or a coffee drinker. But I had to decide when I went to visit a customer whether to accept the shy that they offered, which was half sugar right. and half yeah. tea, or do something else. So that's when I started drinking okay. coffee. And I started drinking it black because I would see like 10 customers a day. 
And so if I had it with sugar and milk, <laughs> that would, you know, I would be double the size and I can't afford wow. to do that. Great story, great story. Yeah, that's the story. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I'm you know, sure, and I'm sure, you know, um, coffee is one of those drinks that really helps you. We talk about uniting business, but it's one of those those things that helps bring people together. Um, so I'm sure you've got Absolutely. some amazing stories about some of the people that you've met along the way and some of the challenges that you've had in in um, helping startups because um, that's obviously the area of work that you're focused on. Um, and some inspiring yes. stories as well. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, well, you know what my thoughts around coffee are as well anyway. So conversation <laughs> for later. So, like I said, we're just waiting yeah. for, uh, for Fahad and Wakar to join. I know there have been some technical issues um, over the past 22 uh, hours or so uh, of the Leader Summit. So, um, one of the challenges of technology, yeah, I'm afraid. Absolutely. But, but you know what? I, you know, um, Fassi and I both like to see and look at things with um, an, an optimistic, you know, glasses more than half full kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's brimming over kind of approach. And it gives us a moment of reflection to have um, a more engaging chat. You know, I've learned something new about you, that you love fresh roasted beans. Um, and these kind of technical issues will happen in life, as with everything. It's just a bump in the road. Absolutely. So, absolutely. So, yeah. so, so they'll join us uh, when they can. But for those listening in, um, this session is... Um, uh, it's a follow-on to the earlier two sessions, but it takes a slight pivot. So here we're looking at, um, obviously, the conversation and the theme is still the SDGs in 2020, a reflection and reinforcement of Pakistan values. So we're trying to get under the hood, as it were, or the bonnet for, for those of uh, us that are from the UK, um, in terms of what is actually happening in Pakistan and why are we so aligned with the SDGs you know, as, as individuals and how that reflects in, in the work and the approach um, that the UN is taking in, in driving the SDGs forward. Um, and this particular session, as you know, is, uh, is sub-themed, um, emerging minds and activating Gen Z and changing lives through the SDGs. So it's a holistic view of um, what are we doing as individuals, as organizations? And, and Pakistan is a great example of um, a startup community. Um, it's got a very vibrant, I, I don't want to say the word youth, because there are entrepreneurs at every level, um, young, old, male, female, transgender, of every background you can think of. So it's really re a really good um, illustration of diversity and inclusivity. So when we talk about emerging minds, that's what we're kind of looking at. You know, this the word emerging is used with Pakistan synonymously these days. So how can we look at that in terms of the um, uh, in in terms of the holistic approach? But also specifically, I want to sort of touch upon the next generation and the generation after that and the generation after that because inherently. Uh, Pakistani value system um, and upbringing is centered around thinking of future generations. So, you know, you get guidance, not just from your parents, but you get guidance from your grandparents and your extended family, and everyone has a say on the individual's upbringing. So given that that's a reflection of Pakistani values and culture, um, it's important to sort of look at that in context in terms of, you know, what are we doing to activate? And we shouldn't just be creating opportunities for the next generations. We should be activating them as well because creating opportunities is one thing, but what can we do now collectively um, to, to activate that? So that's kind of where the, the theme of the session is going. Um, and how can we then use that to, or leverage that better to uh, change people's lives um, enhance uh, people's lives, reduce inequalities, create decent economic work and growth, and how can we address some of the other issues that the world is facing um, that we see in countries like Pakistan, and that aligns us to the SDGs. So that's kind of where we're going with this session. Um, okay. Whilst we're waiting, Jahan, 
Do you want to give a little bit of background to what you've been doing at The Nest? Um, and that will give some sure. context. And, and you can take the opportunity to plug the company, the organization as well, but just a little bit. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm always happy to talk about The Nest. So if you look at the background, I'm in my office right now, and this is the background. So that depicts the energy, the color, the vibrance of the entire place. Uh, and and, and I just want to, sorry, I'm just interjecting there. And you have an unusual title as well. So you're not just the CEO co-founder, you have something. And I want you to say it because I, I would feel a little bit strange saying it. So since this is the nest, I am the big bird. Wow, the big bird, <laughs> excellent. And um, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, chief executives um, in Pakistan look at that as something that is not very professional. A bit quirky. But when you're dealing with startups, and it's always a good conversation piece yeah. when you start out. I even have the big bird written on my card. Excellent. So when, you, when you're introduced to someone, it's, it's a good way to start a conversation. And in the startup ecosystem, we don't take ourselves seriously. It's right. the startups that we take seriously. So, you know, it, it was a good way. And it was something that was chosen by uh, the startup ecosystem, the founders. They thought it was a good idea. And so... I ran with it. Okay, so so the Nest is is an organization. Is it government? Is it private? No, it's totally private. Uh, we are part of the Pakistan Software Association, okay. PASHA, which is the trade association representing the technology se sector in Pakistan. So we started about five and a half years ago. We started the Nest IO because we felt that for the IT sector to grow, we needed many more people to be starting companies in the tech sector, right. growing them and becoming part of the ecosystem. So that's why we started the Nest IO. We were supported by a number of private organizations who funded us because we charge nothing from the youngsters who join. Because some of them with the best ideas wouldn't be able to afford it anyway. So uh, it, it's exciting because, you know, Zubair, what I see is when we're talking about the SDGs, oh, there's Fahad. Fahad. Hi, Fahad. Hey, great, great to have you, Fahad. Finally, finally. Good. Excellent, <laughs> excellent. So it's been a longer <laughs> journey for you, <laughs> even, even though you're just around the corner. Technology never works when you need it, right? So that's how it goes. <laughs> well, look, yesterday, if it happened to a good friend, um, I won't mention his name, um, in the opening plenary session and one of the high level oh, panel speakers yeah you know what i'm talking about um then this is just part and parcel of life um i think we're still waiting for Wakar. sorry jahan you were saying i'll come to you in a moment for hard to do a formal introduction jahan you were saying no well, what i was saying is we've been talking about sdgs and how do we get people and countries to adopt them but i've never seen that as a problem for the startup ecosystem simply because most of the founders look around them and see the problems that this country faces and they try and come up with technologies and companies to address those problems and it's amazing i was looking through some of the uh, companies that we have incubated here at the nest and many of them are addressing the sdgs one or the other Excellent. or sometimes two or three of them yeah so so that's music to fasil's ears because they're potentially all uh, Global Compact members, right? Yeah. Well, so, I don't know about that. So we, we, we started... Maybe I'm not, yeah, I haven't asked them. No, no, well, we should. We should come and see you. Um, we, yes, we started um, SDGs Entrepreneurs Hub last August, I think, wasn't yeah. it, Fassi? Yeah, yeah. Um, in August, and we had... Uh, we did a series of kind of workshops and stuff, and amazing, 32 organizations in there, eight of which... Um, uh, sort of went through the rounds to sign up to be member companies as well and the rest are sort of in the process so definitely we should we should come to to the nest and do do a roadshow sdg roadshow first of all and then also get all those companies organizations into it because they're our future leaders um yes absolutely. they're the organizational leaders that will impact um and reshape the narrative uh, over the next decade so it's important to to, to get them involved as well. Um, Fahad, I'm just gonna to come to you in a moment, but just before I do, um, we've got lots of messages coming on the chat as well. So some great questions. Um, for those of you listening in online, for colleagues of Jahan and Fahad and uh, some of our earlier speakers, uh, please take screenshots, please tweet, 
uh, please post on your social media. Remember the hashtags uniting business, hashtag leader summit, hashtag global compact network Pakistan. Tag all your friends, tell the world that you are part of this global leader summit. We still have another six hours and 29 minutes left of the leader summit. There are lots of sessions going on in parallel. Um, the pavilion's open, there are networking sessions. If you want to connect with any of our speakers here, you can do so directly either through the chat or through uh, their profiles, their LinkedIn, their Twitter accounts are there, and then you can start connecting directly. If you want myself or Fustin to facilitate any of those introductions or conversations, we're on hand to do that as well. Fahad, good to have you on. How are you keeping? Thanks. Yeah, you're all, all right. All right. Stay good. Okay, so Fahad is the Director of Communications and Other Things, um, as I read your bio. And I've known you for quite a while, so I know that you've, you've taken a, a great deal of responsibilities from government relations to many other things. Obviously, you're from Coca-Cola, and I saw you holding the, um, the, the beverage. So it's fine to give the plug, um, as long as everyone's doing their bit for the SDGs. Um, you're based in Lahore, um, so you're, you're seeing a slightly different perspective of Pakistan. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, just before you joined, I gave a slightly brief overview of what the session is about to some of our listeners online. And again, we're talking about, as you know already, um, emerging minds and how can we activate the upcoming generations. Um, but also looking at maybe talking about startups and things like that. Um, we have about 30 minutes left of our allotted set. So whilst we are still waiting for Wakar Ahmed from Nestle to join us, I know he's having some technical difficulties. Hopefully he'll be able to join us. Um, I think, why don't we get started with our conversation? Yeah. So um, I've got Fasihil Karim Siddiqui with me as well, whom you both know. So we'll be jumping in and out of questions. Um, but like we've said to you in uh, previous sessions and to our earlier speakers, uh, feel relaxed. Um, this is a conversation amongst friends. Um, say what you think, say what you feel. Um, it's, you know, open. Obviously, there are people listening in. Um, but just we're just here to have a, a conversation. And the conversation doesn't stop after the Leader Summit. It continues. So um, we look forward to engaging with you further uh, down the road, as it were. Okay, so it's been a, an amazing 22 hours already. Um, have you had a chance to drop in on any of the other sessions? For yeah, some of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah, especially the yeah, especially the the plenaries, the, the intros yeah. last uh, late to last night. So they were very insightful. So definitely, just wanted to share our bits for uh, what we're doing for SDGs and for what yeah, yeah, you know good. our um, organization is doing and what what yeah. you know as an individual I see. Pakistan can do more, and the business community can do more about it. So, good. definitely yeah, so we'll looking forward to that. Yeah. And Jahan, did you get a chance to sit in on any of the sessions? Yes, I was looking to see your session this morning. Uh, that was quite mm -hmm. interesting, especially the one. And it's moved from what CSR used to be. It's moved way beyond, and mm -hmm. we're talking about impact and focus and meaningful engagement, even how we talk to each other. And, and Jahan, you you alluded earlier that. Um, even many of your startups uh, are looking at, you know, impact uh, or solving the world's problems to their services and products, uh, and that aligns to the SDGs. And Fahad, you as an organisation and as an individual on your journey and what you're doing, um, do you do you think that it's important to have an adoption of new mindsets, and do you think that it's um, it's time we built new business models? Um, Jahan, I want to start with you first. What What do you think? What's your take of the whole situation at the moment? So I think as far as the startup ecosystem is concerned, as I was telling you earlier, they're already looking at and are involved in uh, creating impact. And that seems to be the first thing they think of before they look at how much money they're going to make. They think money will come as long as they're trying to solve a problem that somebody in this country faces, especially a large number of people. So you look at healthcare, 
uh, using technology, look at uh, remote education, you look at people with disabilities. So we have several startups that are looking at this area. Uh, you, I didn't even know when I asked one of them how many people suffer from disabilities in Pakistan, I was told it's over 10 million. And so we have a, a, a startup, Wonder Tree. They're using augmented reality to help with the education and the cognitive, cognitive development of young people. And that impact, you know, they've already impacted in the short time they've been around. They've impacted about 4,000 people, 4,000 young people who would otherwise not be included. Similarly, there is another uh, startup by the name of Connect Here that is just dealing with people with hearing disabilities. And that's a couple of million people in this country who have hearing disabilities. And they're trying to bring them into the mainstream. So it's not just, oh, these guys have a problem, let's solve it. It's also, how can we make it more inclusive? So they help a concert for 300 young people who are deaf. And you, would, you and I would never think of this because, you know, these people can't hear. Why are you holding a concert? But what they did was they used lights, vibration, they used signing, a sign language on stage and held it at one of the local universities, Habib University, and watched those young people who experienced music for the first time. It was really, you know, so amazing. So I think we don't have to worry about changing the mindsets of the young people in this country. And we're lucky that we have so many young people in this country. They're looking around, they're solving problems, they're addressing them, they're making sure it includes everybody and is not restricted to just a few. Yes, you know, I was listening to the earlier session and I agree that not everybody has a smartphone, but hey, 78 million people in this country have access, right? That is, let's begin with them and then keep addressing the problem and making so you, sure that more and more people have them. So you mentioned the, a key word there, youth, that we hear a lot these days. Uh, and perhaps we don't have to change their mindsets. But do you, do you think that mindsets needs to be changed at the generation above? So I include myself in that generation. Um, do we need to change our mindsets? Do we need to adopt a slight different approach? Or are we inherently already doing things that are meaningful and impactful? I think a lot of people, especially when I look within Pakistan, are already doing things. Uh, they may not be using technology to do it, but they're still doing yeah. it. They have been impacting. I mean, this country is known for its philanthropy. And so if even if you can't do something yourself, if you can provide the resources to somebody else who can, that's really amazing. And when you look at the earthquake, you look at the floods that we had, and now with the COVID situation, everyone is pitching in to make sure that they can help those who are less fortunate or those who are suffering or to come up with solutions. You know, there's unemployment. There are all sorts of things that are taking place. And I think mindsets are changing. They have to change. When yeah. you face these things, there's no way that you will not be impacted and you will not try and do something to, to change the situation. Yeah. And Fahad, from a business perspective, but also I want to take your own personal individual journey in this in this space as well. Do you feel that businesses generally um, are, are moving in that direction? So are, are businesses more meaningful and more impact focused? And is this a reflection of uh, the values that are instilled in companies like yours? Um, <laughs> Or are they um, a reflection of just what what needs to be done in society? Yeah, so it's, a, it's a bit of both. So, so companies nowadays are really cognizant about the fact that you know consumers are looking for uh, consumer prefer brands and, um, and and products that have a that have a more than the than the what what they stand for you know it's like it's like what what's the ethos what's the what's behind this so you know what talk about packaging you talk about what's inside the product the ingredients where are they sourced from uh where are the proceeds going you know is it is it diversified is it is there a philanthropic uh, leg to it i think companies are becoming very very cognizant of that and you know it's it's also not just about because it's it has to look good uh companies like ours as well you know it, it's like you really believe that you, because you've been in a in, a, in an ecosystem for a long time, you know, uh, companies have been here for hundred odd years, and you know, in individual countries for 
much more than 50, 70 years, they realize that they're part of the fabric of the community because they have a responsibility. They have been based there, they employ people there, they pay taxes, they consume the, 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 the energy, the natural resources of the country. So they automatically have a responsibility, a civic responsibility, a moral responsibility to invest back in those communities. And not just that, they also have to then make sure that they are sustainable. So the products, the packaging, um, uh, the, the communication even, you know, Jahan was talking about innovation and youth and all that. Youth is a word that we um, use, but that uh, truly stands for Pakistan because of the size of the population yeah. that's younger than 35. Um, so yes, companies have to cater to all generations, yours, mine, um, younger, much older, uh, because products nowadays are for everyone. And you know, it's uh, it's about you form an opinion and a preference about a certain company that you know, um, they stand for this and I would definitely pick one over the other. So yes, there automatically becomes a consumer preference. Yeah, and, and for both of you, you know, you come from different kind of ecosystems to use your, your phrase, uh, Jahan, from earlier. Um, do you think that, you know, we talked about mindsets in just a moment ago and Fahad, you've given a, a nice example, an illustration of how um, our, our consumers are more cognizant of, you know, what goes into products and services and, and the impact it has. Uh, and that's obviously shaped perhaps to some extent how you work as then as a business. Uh, and perhaps then goes back to you, Jahan, as how some of the startups are thinking, well, maybe if they're not being serviced uh, 100%, I'm not saying correctly or incorrectly, maybe they're not being serviced fully by the big corporations, then they have to come up and address uh, the situation or those challenges themselves. So that's one context, but from from looking at it from the um, building and trialing new business models, Fahad, I know you you as an organization have moved from the core products and services you produced for years, and now you've gone into different products. So how is this whole kind of um, SDG journey, being more uh, mindful, conscious, cognizant, consumers being more aware. How has that changed the way you do business? And is that going to change given we're in a, this COVID pandemic? Do you think that's going to change even more? Or is it, it's, is it just going to just carry on in the way that you'd envisaged? Yeah, it's very, very interesting. You know, COVID has perhaps made us realize that SVGs have much more value. Um, you know, it's it's like an like a silver lining of COVID. You know, you have to be more responsible towards uh, the the environment, the natural resources, and everything else. So COVID has made us realize that apart from the fact that the pandemic is growing, so I think that SDGs certainly have a huge importance right now because uh, everyone needs to, uh, has al already realized individual companies and people and countries that they have a responsibility. It, this cannot go on like that. We cannot abuse the planet's resources and everything else. Uh, so I think that's, and again, it comes back to companies owning that that space in which they operate. Um, so again, SDGs, uh, I believe, have become much more embedded internally than externally. You know, companies realize that you, they have to make sure that they comply to SDGs, especially one, two, three, for us, it's six stands out more because of the environment that we, the work that we do around environment and water conservation, water replenishment. So even if you're not able to communicate all of that externally, you have to just make sure that internally you are responsible enough and you're complying to that. So I think most of the companies definitely go down that route and COVID perhaps is much more, it's like a, it's like a, a big reality check that, you know, uh, this is serious. Uh, and I think that's you, you, what you've done is effectively underlined the whole theme of the conference which is um you know being more resilient better together uniting business and um you know we'll come out of this much stronger um i just want to pose another point to you if i may um you talked about consumers being more cognizant of and more aware of what goes into ingredients and products i don't want to talk about what goes into your your products um but how do you see moving forward um, mm -hmm. engaging or activating those consumers? And I don't ge gen just generally mean youth, I mean other generations as well, the ones to come and the ones above, you know, uh, ourselves included. What can we do to activate people to be more mindful of what goes into products and what goes into 
or what's behind a service? You know, are there any lessons that you've learned that you could share that perhaps um, others can be inspired from and think, okay, well, I'm a business. Um, I want to do my bit. COVID provides this great silver lining, as you've mentioned, to unite and to, to be uh, more aligned to the SDGs. Um, what can we do to activate them? Yeah. Uh, really fantastic question. So, so very, I'll be very precise on this. So, you know, um, believe it or not, packaging nowadays talks. It's not just your ads, your communication, your digital space and social media. Uh, your packaging talks uh, to everyone. You know, whoever is consuming our product has can see what's on it, what's inside, what's outside, what is it made of, what can you do about it after you consume it. You can recycle it. All our products are recyclable. So that's fantastic. So consumers are already aware that, you know, this product is recyclable and I can go and actually give it to a recycler to recycle it. So there's a whole ecosystem around how products are being made, sourced, uh, what's the ingredient inside. So you know, the first thing is transparency. And one of the things about SDGs is about good health, right? Uh, we talk about that SDG component. Good health means uh, good nutrition, good uh, 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 you know, ingredients for products and everything. It's about what you put in that is sourced uh, the right way and you disclose it. It's up to the consumers as to what they choose. So I think when you talk about future generations to come, informing about the choice. You know, we are the consumer. We serve 2 billion servings every day of Coca-Cola products. 2 billion every day. So that's 2 billion people or servings every day. And people just know what's inside, uh, right? And we're trying to be um, as transparent as we can be with our labeling, with our packaging, with our communication ads and everything else, as ethically we make our ads, as ethically we make our um, our products, which are which are absolutely, you know, um, uh, as part of your uh, daily uh, diet. And to future generations, we're trying to be as transparent, um, as cognizant that, you know, we can provide you more choices. And this, again, uh, complies to one of the few uh, SDG components as well. Okay, great. That's interesting though. And I'll come back to you in a moment because I'm seeing this um, as a possible springboard for um, the SDGs, you know, if if you're aligning yourself to the SDGs as a company, but then you see that you have to react uh, to your consumers who are now more demanding because they're ethically aware or conscious, yeah. then that provides a great springboard and perhaps a catalyst. Jahan, what's your take, given that you kind of occupy a slightly different space? So you've got individuals who come into your ecosystem because they perhaps might um, are frustrated with the products and services that are provided in society, perhaps that's one group, one grouping, or perhaps that they feel that they have a problem that they want addressed, that they have a solution to you. So how do you feel they can be more aligned to the SDGs, you know, given that they're already working in the impact space. You know, what's your kind of take on this? How do we activate them? So they're already activated, but what we've seen now, which is a good sign, is that corporations who were not really paying too much attention to startups that were in the social space addressing SDGs are now actually talking to them, engaging with them, and trying to see how they can collaborate because these youngsters pivot very quickly as the need arises. And we've seen that, especially during the COVID crisis. We need masks, okay, let's try and see if we can arrange for masks, arrange for ventilators, come up with an app that shows you which hospitals have beds available. You know, anything and everything that they can do to make things accessible to people who need it. And I think organizations have seen that. Uh, responsible organizations have started engaging with them to say, okay, uh, what can we do that we as a large organization cannot address right away? But by collaborating with you, we can address these problems and then maybe take it further. So I think that's the role that uh, startups are playing now uh, together with large organizations and mid-sized organizations who see the need and see a role for them. And this we've seen even in the area of fintech where financial mm. inclusion is a big deal right now. And maybe banks cannot address it for a country like Pakistan. So fintech players started by youngsters uh, are now engaging either with banks to provide the solution or with other organizations to make sure that those payment solutions are available. 
so you know it's a good sign it's a good sign that people are collaborating it's a good sign it's not us versus them and so a lot of the sdg issues are being addressed collectively and and do you both think and i'm going to jump back over to fasil in a second um do you both think that again this you know jahan you were talking about that uh youngsters you know in your incubation hub uh, so let me define youngsters. Youngsters can be between the ages of, we've had one as young as 14. And then up to 95, uh, yeah? And then they can be, you know, uh, late 30. Okay. So we've had people within this uh, So, age. So from, from that grouping and the generation above, and for how you talked about your consumers and they're far and wide, uh, and everyone's kind of conscious, and I use that word deliberately, um, do you think that's a reflection of Pakistani values? You know, are we inherently all about doing the right thing, being ethical, mindful? Uh, are we looking at things like sustainability without even realizing it? And is this a reinforcement also of a Pakistan value system? So I'm basically asking, do you think that innately in the, in the DNA of a Pakistani as an individual, then reflective in then him or her position as an entrepreneur, a CEO or a citizen, SDGs are already in their mind, they're built in. Do you think that's that's true to, to have that? that you both not in your head? I think so. You see, you see a lot of the hospitals that have uh, been uh, put up by the private sector. If you look at the NGOs that have been around, uh, these are all, uh, you know, they didn't have to come up but people felt the need for them and went and either raised money or used their own money to set them up and are running them very, very efficiently. So I think people see problems in Pakistan and although they don't see it as uh, philanthropy maybe sometimes, but they see that they need to solve that problem for somebody. And whether it's young people, whether it's businesses, whether it's um, older people, they're all trying to address these. And so when you look at sustainability, we had three graduates who were from NED University, which is in Karachi, who studied civil engineering. And they were going after a very good job. And then they looked at the refugee crisis, the flood situation, the earthquake, and they decided to create sustainable housing that could be assembled in three hours because they felt that the need for housing and sustainable housing was a big deal. And so modulus tech, which was recognized by the UN, UNIDO, uh, you know, the Clean uh, Living Initiative, all of that, they went and did that. Although initially that was not something that would pay off very quickly. It was to help the ecosystem. It was to help people who needed housing and housing that could be transported very easily. Right. I think we, we are almost up uh, on our time, but we want to continue these conversations. Um, so just in advance, in case we uh, do cut out at, uh, at uh, the relevant time, um, I want to thank you all for, for having joined us and shared your insights and thoughts. Uh, Fasil Saab, you know, Jahan has mentioned effectively that no better time for us to be uniting together. You know, So we, the whole Leader Summit is about uniting business. It's not just about leaders. It's about everyone acting stepping up to be the leader, whether they are a CEO of an organization, whether they run a small business, whether they're an entrepreneur, whether they're part of government, whether they're just an individual um, leading everyday lives. Um, what are your thoughts and comments on how can we be better united in Pakistan? What can we do to collaborate stronger? And how can we come through this COVID um, so that we are stronger together, more resilient and more effective moving forward thank you Zubair. uh i am reminded of uh, philip scotler making a very interesting statement in his book marketing 3.0 when he said that communitization is the new order for restoring customers confidence in companies never before than today this statement seems to be coming very true uh, particularly in the context of COVID-19, that what is now needed is that the business has to go for communitization and business and community have to come together to work together to survive and sustain. And 
no matter whether it is an educational institution, no matter it is an NGO, no matter it is a business, no matter it is a, a small entrepreneur or it is an emerging uh, entrepreneur, at this point of time, what is important is that the new values will be defined by the connection of business uniting with community. So this is the crux of whatever challenges we are going to meet. How does business unite with community? And when I say community, the entire spectrum of uh, network that we are talking about will come into picture. So that is where I, I see the uh, is driving us towards that we have to learn to live with the community and their needs and we need to fulfill their needs. So as uh, Fawad said, very rightly, Coca-Cola is one of those companies which are uh, which have been able to live for more than a century now uh, because of its connection to the community. If I if I'm not wrong, because of the connection to the community. Now, God forbid, God for God forbid, today, tomorrow, uh, Coca-Cola is in trouble, and Coca-Cola is not able to stand. The community will stand behind Coca-Cola to say, "No, we want Coca-Cola." Now that is the type of uh, synergy which business and community have to build in, and we are forced to build in that community, that, that relationship, and possibly that is going to define the business of tomorrow. Thank you very much, Fasil Saab. Um, Fahad uh, Jahan, thank you very much for your time. Um, just before we go, um, I want to ask you one question. Um, what does 2030 look like for you? Now, 2030 is the uh, deadline, if you want, or, or we're in the countdown to uh, achieving the SDGs. We have 10 years left. Seems like a long time, but five years have already passed. So what's your 2020, what's your 2030 look like? Fahad, go with you first. Uh, firstly, by 2030, we should have a COVID vaccine. So that's that's number one. Uh, <laughs> but, well, hopefully much before that. Yeah. And secondly, you know, as from, from a company point of view, you know, a lot of companies have set benchmarks for us. It's a pride moment that we, we aim to actually like, as you was saying, you know, you have to listen to consumers, uh, you know, have to listen to them. And we heard and we made a commitment that by 2030, we'll make sure that our uh, entire global packaging is recycled. Um, so these are the kind of SDG commitments that we have signed on to as a company. Right. And we stand by in Pakistan and other places as well. So definitely a much better, cleaner, uh, sustainable world in 2030. Great. Jahan, what's your 2030 looking like? Well, I'm hoping that a lot of the ventures that have begun in the last five, five and a half years that are focused on the SDGs will have scaled and will have got to a position where uh, they are addressing with much more impact the solutions that are needed by this country and actually globally, because there's no reason for them to be restricted to Pakistan once they come up with the solutions that really matter and really address the issue. Okay, and if there's one bit of advice you could both give to anyone in Pakistan and Pakistanis overseas about um, aligning themselves for more meaningful impact, both during COVID, COVID and then after COVID, whether, then whether they are an entrepreneur, an individual, part of a company, government, academia, student, whatever. What what top tip or what advice could you give them in sort of aligning themselves to the SDG or what's the value addition? Fahad, back to you. Okay. Yeah, so my single advice is in your country always, uh, you know, needs you. And, um, you know, you talk about entrepreneurs, technopreneurs, innovators and everyone, they can always contribute back to the back to society and community where they came from. Uh, SDGs will always be part of your of your thinking. So when you talk about sustainable sustainable actions, uh, alleviating poverty, or doing other things, um, SDGs will definitely have to be part of the pro thinking process. Uh, but definitely, Pakistan will always need overseas Pakistan, especially like you. Uh, your country always needs you. Thank you, Jahan. What are your your thoughts on on that? So I would add to that. I think um, think of those who need your support. Think of those that cannot fend for themselves. Think of those who really could use your help right now. 
whether it's in terms of financial assistance, whether it's term, in terms of mental health, dealing with mental health, whether it's in terms of just some support or an ear, uh, just provide it. Because right now we are all facing different kinds of issues. Some of us are more fortunate than others. And I think those that are need to make sure that we look around and see who needs help. Fasil, uh, any thoughts on you on what companies in uh, Pakistan and Pakistani companies overseas could do to align to the SDGs? First of all, they have to build their resilience, uh, which is uh, uh, very important. Secondly, the new opportunities that the COVID is offering uh, needs to be picked up because we are seeing COVID only as an issue, as a problem. It of offers a lot of new opportunities. California was built up after the last influenza pandemic and became the abode of largest number of billionaires in the world. So we have examples where companies uh, have emerged and countries have emerged uh, with much more success after the crisis like the ones we are passing through. So I think the business should keep looking forward to those new opportunities which COVID is offering and try to leverage it out to be able to build their resi resilience and prove their sustainability and survival to be more effective in the interest of society and consumers. Great. I think that's, that's a valuable uh, or, or, or wisdom there as well. Um, I think COVID is um, a unique opportunity to align with the SDGs, whether you're an organization, a company, a startup, entrepreneur. And just, as you said, Fahad, just realign your thinking, as it were, a little bit. Um, listen, guys, I want to thank you both very much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. Um, like I said, the conversation doesn't stop here. It carries on. It continues. Um, we will uh, get together again soon. Um, we'll do that online until we're able to do that in person. Um, Fasil and I will be kicking off the uh, SDGs roadshows in Pakistan, uh, Lahore, Karachi, Islamabad uh, soon. We're just doing the second round of planning on that. Some of that obviously will be virtual, others will be physical once we're able to do that. So we'd like to invite you to be part of that conversation and extend that to your network as well. Um, there'll be follow-up post this session as well, so you can get the chance to share a few more thoughts as you reflect on the conversations today and during the remainder of the summit. We have five hours, 55 minutes. Um, uh, you can share those thoughts uh, with your network uh, and through us on LinkedIn and Facebook. And um, for everyone else that's out there, please do connect to Jahan and Fahad through their LinkedIn. They've got some valuable insights to share about what they're doing uh, in Pakistan for the SDGs, um, sharing some, not just some examples and illustrations, but perhaps some advice and thoughts and reflections as well. Um, so this has been the SDGs in 2020, a reflection and reinforcement of Pakistan's values. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and insights once again. I think we've got some, uh, we've got a nice blueprint, I think, for what the world can look like. And we've got some great examples of some of the things that you guys have been doing, our earlier speakers, and also um, some of the comments that are coming through from our panelists. Um, if you're sending out messages on social media, do please remember to add the hashtag Uniting Business and hashtag Leaders Summit, as well as hashtag Global Compact Network Pakistan. And if you're on Facebook, then come and find Global Network Pakistan uh, on there as well and like share follow um, guys thank you very much we'll speak soon you're welcome to stay thank you, you're thank welcome you, to stay yeah. please do take time thank to jump you. into the other sessions we've got like I say just less than six hours left some great stuff happening in the other sessions and the plenaries uh, and obviously uh, if you get a chance to pop into the pavilion and see what some of the other uh, organizations are doing um, that'd be great. firstly you want to add some more comments at four o'clock Pakistan time, we are having yep. another session of Asia Pacific uh, uh, local networks, which is being hosted by Pakistan, Nepal, and Bangladesh. 
and I would request our viewers and our panelists, if possible, to join us uh, at that time. It's 4 p.m. Okay. Pakistan time. So, Jahan, enough time for you to go and have a couple more coffees and for hard for you to have the red stuff. Great. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> see you soon. Bye-bye. Take care.